Yep. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anthony Covarubias. I'm part of the ECI um, seminar series uh, committee. Um, today, I'm excited to host uh, Dr. I Ying Lim. Dr. I Ying Lim earned her bachelor's in applied bi biology from Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Um, she then went on to earn a master's in nephrology at um, at the University of Hong Kong, and a PhD at the University of Paris, working with Dr. James DeSanto. Um, Dr. Ying Lim then went on to, uh, to a postdoc where she worked with Yasmin Balcade and published um, really um, awesome research on, on, on the infant immune system, uh, including uh, multiple publications in, in and one in science. Um, Dr. Ying Lim has um, subsequently started her lab at Princeton University as of January 1st, 2023. Um, the lab is named the Lab of Infant Maternal Immunity and cleverly named the Limmunity Lab. Um, as um, a person who is, has a baby on the way, um, I'm really excited to hear this talk, which is titled Pre-Birth Immune Education. And um, I'll give the floor to Dr. Ying. Thank you very much. Let me start sharing my screen. Can't you all see my screen? Is my screen sharing okay? I see the notes with the um, oh. associated with the talk. Can you do it? There you go. Perfect. So, um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for invitations and introductions and having me today. Today, I'm really happy to be here to share some works that we are doing, and they are so close to my heart, which is about pre birth immune education. So before I start, I would like to share a very exciting news that I recently launched my research team at Princeton's University Department of Molecular Biology. So if at the end of my talk, you are interested in maternal offspring immune crosstalk, please reach out. I'm more than happy to talk more about the programs that we want to do. So how a single fertilized cells um, divide, differentiates, and becomes a whole human being? I think this is probably the greatest mystery in biology, and but this is the miracles that all of us have done. Along with developmental biology, I'm also fascinated by how hematopoietic stem cells can give rise to diverse immune cells with distinct, um, distinct functions. I think immune system is probably the best examples of diversity because they have to collaborate and to maintain the balance between our body and the environmental challenge. So we all live in an environment that constantly interact with diverse microbes, ranging from virus, bacteria, and a big part of the world's people are still living with parasitic swarm. And on the other, these, all of these, our immune systems, they play a fundamental role um, in maintaining the balance of our body with all of these microbes. And all of these microbes at the same time, they play a role in shaping our immune systems. I'm a developmental immunologist. I'm fascinated by how our immune system responds to these microbes. And at the same time, how, do I, um, how, has, how does this microbe shape the development of our immune systems? So when I begin my scientific careers as an immunologist, I study the development of innate lymph cell, ILC. So ILC are considered as the innate counterparts of T cell based on their transcriptions factor and the cytokine productions. We have ILC1, 2, and 3, which corresponds to TH1, 2, and 17 cell. They mainly accumulate at the mucosal site and they are able to respond and fight against different infections agents. <clears throat> Fetal liver and adult bone marrow has been considered as the factory <clears throat> to generate different kinds of mature ILC because this is the place where ILC precursors has been identified in the murine system. We want to study the developments of human ILC. And so the first place that we look for are the polyfer blood of healthy in individuals. So in the blood from both humans' cold and adult blood, there's a subset of ILC that they are the helper ILC, but they do not actually express mature ILC profile. <clears throat> when we look for the transcriptomic and chromatin landscape of this cell, we found indeed they share a lot of profile with hematopoietic stem cell, but they carry the ILC profile at the poyo state. So we decided to develop the in vitro cloning and in vivo transfer systems to understand the developments of this cell. 
Surprisingly, when I isolate these cells and put them into the culture dish, they are able to give rise to all the ILC subset, and we observe the same phenomenon in, in the in vivo systems. Therefore, we think this is the ILC precursors circulating in the human's blood. Other than the polyfer blood, we also found these ILC precursors in various tissues, including sweeter liver, pediatric tonsils, and adult lung. And when we isolate them at the clonal levels, they are able to give rise to give to give rise for a diverse subset of ILC. Therefore, we put together a human tissues ILC process concept that we think the ILC precursors are circulating in the blood. They can go into the tissues and depends on the environmental signals that they see, they can give rise to diverse subset. One thing that really surprises us is when I isolate these ILC precursors from the tonsil, they can give rise equally to ILC 1, 2, and 3. But when I take them out from the fetal liver, they are much more preferable to become ILC 3. But if I take them out from the adult lung, they are much more preferable to become ILC 2. So these findings really sparked my interest into tissues immunity, which drive me to understand how, are we, how the tissues environments wire the differentiations of the immune cell, and at the other side, how our immune system integrate with the tissues development. And this process, developments of our immune systems, begins in uteros in parallel to organogenesis in a highly coordinated manner. Immediately after birth, um, our various tissues, um, ranging from skin, lung, and the gut, start to colonize by diverse microbes. And the proper developments of our immune system require proper inputs during these critical windows. And this can have a long-term impact throughout the adulthood. And once these windows is closed, it is very difficult or impossible to reopen them again. So a series of epidemiology studies have suggested during these critical windows, um, the maternal environmental exposures can wire the upstream immune system through transplacenta transfer or through breast breastfeedings. Despite all of these observations, mechanistically, how the mother's um, environmental exposures wire the upstream immune system remain largely unexplored, which is the questions that we want to express, want to address. So it, this really drive me to explore how maternal environmental exposures, if the mother, for example, have an infection during the pregnancy, or they take certain kind of diet, or if they are traveling and they encounter new microbes, how does this expose, exposures impact on offspring immune systems? So a few years ago, I joined Yasmin Belke Lab at NIH to address these questions in infectious disease. So a lot of infections during the pregnancy has been focused on those severe or vertical transmittable infections, such as Zika, Toxo, or Listeria. These pathogens can directly pass through the placenta and infect the fetus, which can lead to developmental defect and premature birth. Yet what is more common is that faced by the pregnant women are those transients or asymptomatic infections, such as common cold or stomach flu, or coronavirus can be transient and asymptomatic as well. So how does transient and asymptomatic infections during the pregnancy impact on offspring tissues immunity with the questions that we are trying to address? To do this, we first use an attenuated strain of foodborne pathogens, Yersinia pseudotuberculosis. So I infect a time pregnant mice during gestation day 10.5 with your M mutant strain of Yersinia. The reasons why we pick um, day 10.5 gestations is because for the fetus, the hematopoietic stem cells start entering the fetal liver and they give rise to diverse immune cells. So what we observe from the mother is, trans, is this dope and mutant strain of Yersinia oral infections lead to really transient body weight drop, but they are able to recover and deliver comparable numbers of pups um, after that. So the peak of infections by measuring the bacteria's DNA is from day three post-infections. By day nine post-infections, the mother is completely clear with the infections. So this yolk and mutant strain of Yersinia restricted to the gut and they rarely disseminate and we never detect any live bacteria or bacteria's DNA from placenta or from fetal liver, indicating yolk on mutant strain of Yersinia provide us a maternal restricted transient infections models. 
So the things that we really want to understand is how does this transient infections that experienced by the mother during the pregnancy impact on the offspring immune system when they reach adulthood? So when the offspring reach adulthood, I take out their burial tissues, skin, lung, and their gut, and I look for various lymphocyte subset in these burial tissues. So in all my following slides, I'm comparing the offspring delivered by the mother who received PBS, showing as maternal control, or the offspring delivered by this transient infected mother, showing as maternal yolk M. And the most striking phenotypes that we found at these burial tissues are actually in their small intestines in the T helper cell subset. So in the T helper cell, um, the small intestine lamina propria, we observe an induction of rho gamma T positive T17 cell accumulate inside the gut in both frequency and in cell number. This is happens in the small intestines, but also in the large also in the large intestines, but not in the skin, nor in the lung. And we do not observe other striking difference across other lymphocytes and the other burial tissues. So these inductions of tier 17 happens right after weaning, and we do not observe in the subsequent liters delivered by this infected mother, indicating the infections induced tier 17 accumulations in the GI tract are not caused by maternal long-term imprinting. So it begins to wonder, how does transient infections lead to T17 specific inductions inside gut, whether this is in print inside the T cell or this is drive by the gut environments? To address these questions, we, use, um, we took advantage of Seber transgenic mouse line in which their T cell receptors are specific to commensal derived flagellins. The beauty of this model is when we transfer this Seber transgenic cell to the mice, they will home to the gut. So as what has been published, if you transfer this Sibyl transgenic cell to the naive mice, they home to the gut, but they remain naive. But what really surprised us is when we transfer them to the recipients that delivers by the UM infected mother, they home to the gut and they start to differentiate into T17 cell. So what we found so far is the yolk M infections during the pregnancy lead to a gut-specific induction of T17, and this is driven by the gut environments. So given that we know infections can change the gut environments, particularly for their microbiota compositions, we next wonder whether this is this imprinting is depends or um, due to the change in the infections alter microbiota compositions. So to test this hypothesis, we decided to look for the fecal microbiota from these offspring delivered by the control or your M infected mother by 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing. However, we do not observe any significant difference in the films level, but really a minus difference in the family level. To access whether these small changes at the family levels of the microbiota can contribute to the inductions of T17, we decided to do this cross-fostering experiment, which is by far my favorite experiment in the last few years. So we took the offspring delivered by the in, um, control mother from day one post-birth, and we give it to the transients of previously infected UM mother. And vice versa, we took the offspring delivered by the infected mother. From day one post-birth, we give it to a naive um, mothers. And these, they are raised by this mother um, from, three, from the first three weeks of life, and then they are weaned. So when we look these mice when they reach adulthood, as what I have shown you before, if they are delivered by the yolk M infected and fostered by the same mother, they have the inductions of T17 in their GI tract. But real, what really surprised us is no matter who was fostering them, as long as they are delivered by this previously infected mother, and even they are fostered by the control mother, they have the inductions of T17 in their GI tract, which tells us two things. First, this is independence on the microbiota, and second, this is happens before birth. So we have a series of hypotheses to explain this prenatal imprinting. One of that is through the soluble factors from the mothers can pass through the placenta and imprint the offspring. So to test this hypothesis, we decided to perform a serum transfer experiment. So we took the serums from an infected mother from day three and day five post-infections. We give these serums to a naive time pregnant mother. 
And of course, we make sure by transferring serums, we did not actually transfer any live bacteria by measuring, um, by using the yolk, yolk E is the um, tetramers for Yersinia. We do not, the mothers do not, the serum recipients do not mount any res, um, response to Yersinia, indicating they haven't seen the antigens in their life. Nevertheless, what we found is this yolk M serum recipient's mother, when they deliver the offspring, they still have the inductions of tier 17 in their GI tract. This suggesting the inductions of tier 17 cells in the gut of offspring um, can be induced by maternal soluble factors. Next, we want to understand what is the factors from the serums of the mother can imprint these long-term immunities in the offspring. Given that we are immunologists, of course, the first things that we look for are the cytokine. So we perform a cytokine screening, and we found amongst the cytokines that we screen, IL-6, interferon gamma, GCSF, and TN alpha are the cytokines that can be induced by YOPM infections in the time pregnancy model. To test if any of these cytokines can lead to inductions of TA17 cell in the GI tract of offspring, we perform our gain of function experiments by directly injecting each of these cytokines to a naive time pregnant mother, and we analyze their offspring when they reach adulthood. And among these cytokines, what we found is IL-6 injections alone, by, but not interferon gamma, GCSF, or TNF, are contribute to the inductions of TA17 cell in the gut of offspring when they reach adulthood. To really examine if IL-6 is not only sufficient, but necessarily for impact on, met, um, on the, the maternal yolk M models, we decided to neutralize the IL-6 priors to infections. So we inject these time pregnancy mothers with anti-IL-6 and we perform the yolk M infections. Of course, we make sure that anti-IL-6 doesn't change the mother's response to infections, that we still see um, around 20% of them disseminate, but none of the bacteria can transfer across the placenta and to the fetal liver. Nevertheless, what we found is IL-6 neutralizing during maternal infections can completely dampen the TA17's accumulations in the GI tract of offspring, supporting the idea that maternal IL-6 that induced by UM infections can contribute to the inductions of the gut in the offspring when they reach adulthood. So our data so far suggests the change of microbiota was not responsible for the inductions of TA17. We're next wondering whether microbiota is required for this imprinting process. To address this point, we decided to inject the germ-free mice with IL-6, and we kept their offspring either in the germ-free facility, or we conventionalized them to the, to the SPF environments after weaning. So what we found is the IL-6 um, injected mother, if their pups is remains in the germ-free, we did not observe any inductions of tier 17 in their GI tract. But for the later mates that we, when we conventionalize them to the SPF environments, we start to see the inductions of the tier 17 cell in their GI tract. So this data suggests that IL-6 derived from the mothers can mediate these tissues imprintings independence on the maternal microbiota, but this allowed the offsprings to have heightened immune response to the microbiota and mouse TA17 cell in their GI tract. So what we found is the IL-6 are the factors that induce these TA17's accumulations in the GI tract of offspring to enhance their response to microbiota. But we want to know, how does it work? How does early life IL-6 exposures lead to this long-term imprinting? To address these questions, we first look at IL-6 expressions in the GI tract of offspring uh, of the fetus when they are still inside um, the womb of the mothers. To really, to our surprise, what we found is IL-6 receptor expression by, by both flow cytometry and confocal imaging. We found the intestinal epithelial cell, they indeed express IL-6 receptor at the intermediate level. So you can appreciate, I hope you can appreciate from here, the APCAM positive cells in the fetal gut, they actually express IL-6 receptor. And more importantly, the downstream signaling of IL-6 is phosphostatory. 
We found the fetus carried by the mother who has been in, infected with Yersinia or injected with IL-6. They have the inductions of um, phosphostatry in their gut intestinal epithelial cell, indicating the intestinal epithelial cell of this fetus can respond to the environmental signal experienced by the mother. To really rule out these IL-6 expressions in the intestinal epithelial cell are the ones that contribute for the TS-17 response in the GI tract. We decided to delete, specifically delete IL-6 receptor from intestinal epithelial cell by using this v -like and IL-6 receptor flux systems. So by confocal imaging, we make sure that there's a specific deletions of IL-6 receptors in the gut epithelial cell of this offspring. And by comparing to their litter mates, what we found is the creep positive mice that who has been deleted with this IL-6 receptor have much lower um, T17 cell accumulations in their GI tract, indicating that the IL-6 receptor signaling in the fetal gut epithelial cell are the ones that are responsible to T17 response in the GI tract of the offspring. So even though we found IL-6 receptor, um, IL-6 is the ones that contributes to that, and then it activates the intestinal fetal epithelial cell. We still very puzzling. How does this early life exposures can have such a long term impact throughout the adulthood? Well, I was really wondering about these questions. It was pre pandemic time back in 2019. I read this very beautiful paper from Kim Jensen. They actually did a series of um of lineage tracing experiments. And what we found, what they found is actually the fetus intestinal epithelial cell or the APCAM positive cell, regardless for their um, positions or LGR5 expressions, as long as they are coming from this fetus intestinal epithelial cell, they can contribute to the LGR5 intestinal epithelial stem cell when they reach adulthood. After reading this paper, I was very excited because what it means is if the fetus intestinal epithelial cell express IL-6 and they have been activated during fetal state, there might be some um, alterations in the adult intestinal epithelial stem cell. So we decided to get the LGR5 reporter mice, which will allow me to isolate the intestinal epithelial stem cell from the offspring delivered by the control or IL-6 injected mother. So we get this mine from Jackson Lab. We wait pa patiently for two months and eventually we finally get the offspring. So because from the literature, there's a series of study have shown the epithelial stem cell from various tissues can ca carry the chromatin, uh, can have the alterations in the epigenetics profile when they have uh, insulations. Therefore, based on this study, we decided to look at the chromatin landscape of this intestinal epithelial stem cell from the offspring delivered by the control or IL-6 injected mother. So by doing ataxic, what we found is there is around a thousand unique speed that can be induced by the can be induced when the mother has been injected with IL-6 during the pregnancy. And this is induced throughout the adulthood of the offspring. Um, in their intestinal epithelial stem cell. Because intestinal epithelial cell, stem cell constantly regenerate and they, they give rise to all the mature intestinal epithelial cell. So we next wonder these inductions of chromatin landscape in the offspring, whether they change any trans, um, any epithelial cell subset profile in this offspring, or also whether they change any transcriptomic landscape. To address these questions, we decided to use a tool for single cell RNA-seq, which will not only allow us to identify the intestinal epithelial cell in this offspring, but also allow us to look for the transcriptomic landscape of each subset of the epithelial cell. So we found all the subsets that people has been described in the intestinal epithelial cell, but we do not observe any alterations in the gut epithelial cell compositions between the offspring delivered by the control or IL-6 injected mother. However, when we zoom in into the stem cell and the anterior side, what really surprises us is in both subset of intestinal epithelial cell, both stem cell and anterior side, first, they have the inductions of MHC class II machinery, and second, they have the inductions of bacterial defense machinery.
So based on the literature, there was a series of study have suggest MSC class two expressions by intestinal epithelial cell can link to colitis. Therefore, based on these data, we decided to look how does this offspring first respond to infections and second, how do they respond to inflammations? So for infections, we use an acute models of salmonella infections. So for the offspring delivered by the control or IL-6 injected mother, when they reach adulthood, we infect the offspring with salmonella. And although we do not see a striking difference at the very beginnings of the infections, but by day four and day five infection, post salmonella infections, we observe a reduction of bacterial burdens inside the feces of the offspring delivered by this IL-6 injected mother. They have reduced bacterial disseminations to the circulations, and more importantly, it can improve the survival of the offspring after salmonella infections. We also have performed this in the offspring who has been delivered by the UPM infected mother, and we observe the similar, similar phenomenon. Other than um, infections, we were also wondering how does the offspring respond to colitis or gut inflammations? So to address these questions, we use DSS-induced colitis to check how does the offspring respond to these gut inflammations. So um, the two landmark of the DSS-induced colitis is body weight drop and shortens length of the cones. What we found is the yolk M infected and the IL-6 injected, um, ops, the, the ones that delivers by the UPM infected or IL-6 injected mother, they have much more significant body weight drop as compared to the offspring delivers by the control mothers from day 10 post DSS treatments. And we found a much more shortened length of columns in this offspring as compared to the control, indicating transient infections or IL-6 exposures can increase the susceptibilities to gut inflammations. We also have performed this in the CD4 transfer um, colitis models, and we observed the similar phenomenon. And altogether, what we found is transient infections during the pregnancy can increase the cytokine IL-6 productions from the mother. And these IL-6 are able to pass through the placenta and activates the fetus intestinal epithelial cell. And these early life activations can lead to epigenetics imprintings in the adult epithelial stem cell pool. And so these enhanced epi um, epigenetics memories can lead to enhanced response to microbiota. And so these accumulations of T17 cell in the GI tract. With these T17 and the alterations in the gut environments, this offspring can have a protections against infections, but at the other side, they have a higher susceptibilities to inflammations. Altogether, what I have been showing you in both humans and mouse immunologists, what we think about this is our immune system is highly plastic and it can adapt to the environments um, that even before birth. The speculations that we have is if the mothers have experienced infections in their life during the pregnancy, they want to prepare the offspring for entering the environments that they will have a higher potential to experience infections so they can have a protections against that. But the downside is the heightened immune response will lead to enhanced susceptibility to inflammations. So I think I have been extremely lucky throughout my scientific career to have the generous support and mentorship from very great scientists. And the first part of the work is I have I did that together with James DeSanto as a PhD student back in Paris. Um, that was really a wonderful time. And after that, I moved to NIH and I have really incredible mentor, Yasmin Belke, who has been really supportive for me to build my career. And as what um, Anthony was mentioned, I launched my research team two months ago at Princeton's University Departments of Molecular Biology. This is really a multidisciplinary environment that we aim to address. We work on really diverse fundamental biology questions. So the lab that we want to build aims to address two questions in immunologies. First, we want to understand how does the methanol environmental exposures 
educates the offspring immune systems to enhance the immune fitness of the offspring, both during pre-birth and also post-birth nurturing periods. And the second question that we want to address is really how does the women's body during the pregnancy can adapt to a fetus both during pregnancy and the lactations? Um, we have two founding members who joined our lab recently, Chris and Jacob. And if you're interested in maternal offspring immune crosstalk, and if you believe in understanding this can really improve women's and children's health, please reach out to me and I'm more than happy to discuss. Um, with this, I would like to thank you all for joining me today and I'm happy to take any questions or feedback for our work. Thank you very much. Yeah, really awesome talking. Um, so I wanted you. to see if we have any questions um, in the YouTube channel. So if anyone has any questions, please put it in the chat and we could um, have Dr. Lim um, at, um, answer them. Um, but just to kick off the questions, um, so I just thought it was a really fascinating talk. So it seems to be a risk versus reward in, in generating an immune response to, um, you know, whatever the, the mother is exposed to. And so you, you showed this very elegantly um, using like a bacteria um, infection. Um, however, I was really curious about um, viral infections and particularly, for example, SARS-CoV-2, where we're not quite sure what is the long-term um, impact of if mother's exposed to this virus. And so I, I'm not sure if you could comment on that. Yeah, I think um, for the models that we have been using with Yersinia, um, which lead us to identify IL-6 as a factor, um, can imprint in the gut environments. So I think um, how does virus infections um, during COVID have the impact? Or the other questions that I've been keep thinking about is how about the worm infections, like a big part of the world has been living with that. How does these different kind of infections imprint? Um, from my opinions, I think IL-6 could probably happen during COVID infections because this is one of the factors um, that can be induced at, after virus infections. But specifically, how about our other virus that impact? I think this is still an open question, um, remains to be explored. Um, of course, the, the, um, that that actually built like in the future is some things that we could think and do about that. I think the other questions that I've been thinking is, how do we select the memory coming from the mother? Because these Yersinia infections is really a transient infections, right? How, whether the infant should actually pick the memories that is more leaning toward like chronic infections. So um, this is all open questions that we hope to address using a mouse models um, in the laboratory. And hopefully we can have a better insight in the future. Awesome. Yeah, I'm excited to, to see your future work on this area. Uh, so I, I think there's there is some questions in the YouTube channel. So the first one is uh, Nardi Gomez Lopez um, asks: Is the TH17 is the TH17 response antigen specific? Hmm. Yeah. How about the antigen specificity of this T17 response? Um, whether they are specific to Yersinia or any antigens or, or any microbes, we haven't addressed that. And I think it's the really important. Um, experiments for us to do is to look for the TCR receptors for this T17 cell that induce. Um, this is really a good question. However, we still haven't have an answer whether they are specific to any commensal microbes, um, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so another question is, uh, Renique Kidney asks a beautiful talk. Will BMC of donor hematopoietic cells into progeny of infected mothers still have an increase in inflammatory responses? Would you mind to repeat? Um, um, it says, well, BMC, um, bone marrow uh, um, yeah, cells of donor hematopoietic um, Will BMC of donor hematopoietic cells into progeny of infected mothers still have an increase in inflammatory responses? Yeah, I guess these questions is more about this imprinting um, in the Yersinia or IL-6 models, it happens in the hematopoietic cell or whether it's in the gut environments. We don't, so the experiments that we have done um, to really, we, we, we haven't do the bone marrow transfer models, but I don't think that would be the case for the reasons that when we do this zebra transgenic cell, I think this is more like drive by the gut environments because when we transfer the zebra cell from a naive mice that who have not encountered any IL-6 or Yersinia, when we put them in the offspring, 
um, gut environments, I think they still have the induction. So we think it's more driven by the gut environments rather than in the hematopoietic um, cell level. Okay. Another question from Shu. Um, beautiful work. Can you share some thoughts about which type of epigenetic memory is induced by IL-6 and maintain mm -hmm. your early adulthood? And how long does this memory um, last? How long does the epigenetics memory last um, in the adulthood? So the experiments that we did was really um, from the, all the experiments in the adult that I've been showing you is from week eight up to week 12. So it's also the times that we take, um, we isolate the in intestinal epithelial stem cell from the offspring. So we haven't looked for the longer terms in the epigenetics mark, but for the TH17 response, we did look up to 20 weeks. We still see the inductions of TH17 cell. So which I think um, it's probably more for the long-term, but to really do that, we probably have to do um, the experiments in the later time point. Okay. Um, Jing Zeng um, said, thanks. What is the source of IL-6 upon infection? Oh, how does, um, who is producing IL-6 um, post Yersinia infections? Um, it's a good question. I think there's ways to look at that. For example, staying for IL-6 post Yersinia infections. Um, we haven't done that, but I think it's more coming from the gut environments. There's a lot of cell can actually produce IL-6. Um, another question from Shu. Um, IL-6 is induced by many types of challenges in addition to bacteria infections. Um, what do you think that they would all lead to enhance IL-17 response in the gut? Yeah, um, it's really a good question that we have been thinking about. To be honest, I think it's one of the possibility because um, let's take, let me say like when I found this IL-6, I indeed look for the literatures and indeed IL-6 is one of the cytokine that can gradually increase in the normal pregnancy, even without infections, which actually make me wonder whether IL-6 is just a factor to educate the immune system. It's very true that IL-6 can induce in various kinds of infections or inflammations. And our models is a transient infections models in a mouse systems. And I think what we still have to pinpoint is how long, like the dose and the durations of IL-6 exposures. So we are doing that in such a short time point as, as a transient infections. But what happens if the pregnant women have a constant or really high dose of IL-6 during the pregnancy, whether they will have any other like um, catastrophic consequence in the offspring? Um, I think this is a very good question that we want to address also. Yeah, to follow up, I have my own question related to that. So um, in regards to non-infectious um, sources of cytokines, we know exercise, for example, is very beneficial, but it also is a source of loss of cytokines, including IL-6. So it'd be interesting to see whether um, exercise and cytokines associated with exercise actually help in train or imprint the, the fetal immune system as well. So um, this yeah. is... Uh, I'm not sure if you've, if you've thought about that or is that something you've... Um... Those are all very good questions. I think I think more about like, how do the IL-6, whether it's like the dosage, like which level of IL-6 that is required and whether there's too much or too little, um, how do we, let's say, titrate this IL-6 level to really have a beneficial impact in the offspring? So um, we find the factors. We, we suggest that the mechanistically this could really happen. Um, I think the broader view is how does this imprinting happen? Because thinking about we live in a society that we have different challenge every day and how does this mechanistic work? Um, I think it's really an open question. Okay, um, Nathan Shu. Um, asks, are the fetal intestines um, uniquely responsive to IL-6 or are there fetal organs that are also, also express high levels of IL-6 receptor? Yeah, this is really a great question that we think about that a lot, why IL-6 transfer across the placenta to the serums of the fetus, why it's only got specific um, inductions for T17. So um, two reasons. The first reason is the IL-6 receptor expressions. So when we look for IL-6 receptor expressions in the fetal stage, we see that in the gut epithelial cell, but not the epithelial cell from the other burial tissues that we check skin and in the lung, the epithelial cell in other burial tissues, they do not express the IL-6 receptor. And the second thing, but it's still open to questions whether they can express other cytokine receptor and other cytokine signaling can have this imprinting probably um, for example, skin can be imprinted by IL-13 or IL-4 if they express the receptor, 
right? So I think IL-6, the reasons why it's specifically inside the gut is because fetal gut intestinal epithelial cell express IL-6 receptor. But the second thing um, is more from the developmental biology landscape um, view because the gut intestinal epithelial cell, when they are in the fetal, they all become intestinal epithelial stem cell when they reach adulthood. So um, I think it might also go with the developmental process. I don't know how it is happening in the skin and in the lung, whether they all contribute to the stem cell pool. Um, these might be the questions that has to be addressed by developmental biology. Um, so I think we went through all the questions on the YouTube um, channel. Um, I just want to ask if anyone on the committee has any um, other questions for, for Dr. Min. Okay. Um, I don't think anyone else has any questions. So, um, sorry, one second. Yeah, so I think what we'll do is um, we could go ahead and um, end the seminar, or at least the YouTube um, portion, and then maybe we could talk offline. Sounds good. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Lim. A really fascinating talk. <laughs> yeah, really it, great. It was really awesome. Thank you. It has been a while. I, I would just, Lisa, I was just saying, 